Hello, this is Dr. Gitanjali Shetty. I'm a practicing dermatologist and cosmetologist based in Mumbai. My today's talk is going to be about the current scenario of fungal infection. Dear friends, there has been an increase in the prevalence of fungal infection over the past four to five years across the country. Fungal infection have undergone a sea change in its clinical pattern in the past few years. The initial standard treatment recommendation we all used is no longer being valid or even realistic these days. Also, we are seeing a large number of lesions these days. Generalized pattern, atypical presentations of tinea, more than one anatomical locations is very common. Tinea cruris or corporis is getting more common these days. Since we know for the correct treatment, a correct diagnosis is needed, today we will see depending upon the parts of the body, what are the various differential diagnoses. Let us first start with the groin area. Now, whenever you see scales in the inner thigh, with reddish lesions sparing especially the scrotal and the penile area, then your diagnosis is that of a tinea cruris. Genital dermatophytosis is observed to be seen more commonly in males and occurs more commonly on the genital area, especially the penile area rather than the scrotal area. It's almost always accompanied by tinea cruris or tinea cruris or corporis. Often, these patients will have lesions on the base of the penis that is hidden by the pubic hair as well as on the perineum and scrotum. This most importantly makes it essential to examine the penile area by lifting it, lifting the penis away from the scrotum which too may be affected uncommonly. In case of females when it occurs it usually affects the mons pubis and the labia majora. Now, if the lesions are beefy red plaque, may be surrounded by numerous smaller red macules located adjacent to the body of the main lesion with peripheral scaling which involves a scrotum, then it is also a case of candidial intertrigo. Hence, this differential must also be kept in the mind. In case the lesions are reddish brown with no active border, then it's a case of erythasma. Now, the presence of greasy scales in the groin proves to be a case of seborrheic dermatitis. Let us now see when you see different types of lesions on the trunk and the extremities. Now when you see well-defined annular reddish margin lesions with well-defined borders, central clearance and pruritus, then your diagnosis is that of tinea corporis. When you see asymptomatic hypopigmented, hyperpigmented patches on upper arms, chest, back with itching, then it's a case of tinea versicular. When you see itchy lesions along with a history of atopy, a lot of lichenification, a lot of itching, then it's a case of atopic dermatitis. Silvery scales with nail pitting and lesions in other parts of the body with no history of itching gives you a past history of psoriasis, then it's a case of psoriasis. Aggregated scales, no central clearing, then it's a case of numular eczema. Another type of scale is the greasy scale which has a classical typical distribution around your nasolabial folds, your hairline, around the eyebrows and chest then your diagnosis is a straightforward seborrheic dermatitis. Case of single lesions, the herald patch, that is what we call them, which progress frequently to generalized rash in the next one to two to three weeks, then your diagnosis has to be that of a case of a pityriasis rosea. When in the trunk and in the extremities, you don't see scaling, but there are vesicles, pustules, lesions that are smooth, non pruritic and when the lesions are seen normally on your hand and feet then it's a case of granuloma annulare. When you see patients with absolutely no scales having history of dusky erythematosis, a single lesion, there's this classical history of probably a sulfur drug or an acetaminophen or ibuprofen or antibiotic, you'll have to go for a detailed history in such case then your diagnosis is a straightforward fixed drug eruption.
let us now talk about different type of lesions that we commonly see on the feet. When the lesions are distributed and there's involvement of the interdigital skin with fine scales on the sole of the foot. And when there's this history that the patient has been using occlusive footwear, then this has to be a case of tinea pedis. When there's absolutely no involvement of the interdigital skin, and the lesions matches the area of footwear and there is coexisting swelling, redness, itching, history of blister and pain, then it is a case of contact dermatitis. When there is an appearance of the tapioca pudding like, like history of vesicle, blisters on the lateral aspect of the digital and sole, then it is usually commonly a history of a dishydrotic eczema. This is commonly seen in the spring season. If there is involvement of other sites, nail pitting, then your diagnosis is a straightforward psoriasis. I think all of us are now facing a big issue when it comes on to treating a fungal infection. There is or there has been always a failure in getting to the right, probably the treatment based on the right diagnosis. The major issue now has been recurrence of fungal infection. I think all of us have been facing it and it is not the drug resistance. Therefore, it's important to ascertain whether it's a relapse or it's a treatment failure before deciding on the right type of treatment. Initially, we all thought that poor adherence probably to the treatment or probably poor patient compliance plays an important vital role in relapse and incomplete clearance of fungal infection. However, the recent research work has shown that the residual spore load is what plays a very important role in reinfection as well as reoccurrence. So let's talk about what are these fungal spores. Fungal spores are nothing but microscopic reproductive structures in fungi. These spores have thick walls and can withstand environmental stress that enables them to survive during unfavorable conditions. Residual spore load are the fungal spores that remain at the site of infection if probably the treatment is left halfway or incomplete. These residual spores that stay behind further reproduce again and grow in number to form mature fungus and this hence leads to the fungal recurrence. We have also observed that even topical antifungal creams need to be applied for a longer duration. Studies show that stoppage of the oral or the topical therapy before 3 weeks, which is the recommended time, is often associated with the reappearance of pre-existing lesions or even new lesions in other areas of the body. Let us now discuss some tips to prevent the fungal infection or rather how do we counsel our patients who come with this recurrent problem of fungal infection. We are seeing a sea change in the prescription patterns in private practice as well as well as in the academic departments. Along with these medications, I personally feel patient counselling has become the most important aspect of treating fungal infection. The following are the few tips that we need to follow which will be very beneficial for most of our patients. Firstly, please stress on the importance of regularity of medication and adherence to the advised prescription by the doctor. The second most important tip that we need to tell our patients is the topical antifungal has to be applied 2 cm beyond the margin of the lesion continuously for at least 2 weeks till there is a clinical resolution. In today's generation, we also need to advise most of these teenagers in wearing against tight garments jeans, leggings, jeggings, etc. Make sure you wear loose fitting, cotton garments, light weighted, especially during the summer. Discourage sharing of bed linen if feasible, towels, personal clothing, etc. Regular washing of towels, bed linens is very important and part of the therapy. In fact, in an interesting study, T. rubrum survived for more than 12 weeks on a towel whereas T. mentagrophytes survived for almost more than 25 weeks on towels. This fact itself highlights the importance of disinfection of clothes, which is best done by just washing your clothes in hot water at around 60 degrees. 
and also drying them well in sunlight. In fact, sunlight is considered to be the most effective disinfectant for dermatophytes. The other most important fact is taking regular showers and always wearing your clothes only after you've dried yourself thoroughly well under the fan. Washing clothes, bed linen in hot water and then sunning them in case of a cloudy day or a cloudy weather or rainy season, ironing the clothes would be much more beneficial. Attention also needs to be paid to the inner garment. Wearing completely dried inner garment or even ironing it again before wear is very important. Also, if there is a person infected in the house, make sure your patients are washing their infected clothes separately. Patients who are in particularly infected with tinea cruris also needs to wear loose fitting shorts instead of the tight fitting nylon undergarments which actually hug the groin and cut into it. Most of our patients for some religious lesions have some type of cotton threads or waistbands which are tied. This has to be specifically removed as this could also be the carrier of the fungal spores. People who are infected with the generalized infection of tinea corporis or infection of tinea pidis have to be advised in wearing open, loose-fitting footwears, visa versa or non-occlusive tight-fitting closed footwear thus allowing breathing space to the skin. Coming on to the environment, dusting, wet mopping or even vacuuming the house followed by cleansing the house with detergent so as to reduce and remove the spore load in the immediate environment is seen to be helpful. Explaining all this is surely very time consuming. However, over a period of time, we've all realized apart from giving them good oral regime as well as topical regime, along with compliances, the other points are also very vital in taking care of and also in completely eradicating fungal infection. I thank you a lot for your patient listening. 